Hello, everyone. Welcome to my session. My name is Max Körbecher, and I hope you had so far a very great open source summit. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you today in Dublin, but I hope we will connect somewhere soon on the platform, on LinkedIn or Twitter. And I'm very happy to answer your questions also later. So my session will be about seeding environmental sustainability into the cloud native community. But first, who am I? Well, my day job is actually about Kubernetes consulting and the cloud native advisory itself it means having a look where the customer are moving to uh, a more cloud agnostic approach with open source software, uh, most of the time based on Kubernetes, obviously, and um, help them with their digital transformation um, and getting more cloud ready, cloud native. Um, and yeah, so I'm actually an enterprise architect by heart. This is my profession from the last years, but around 2016, the end of 2016, I've somehow found Kubernetes was in a nice project. And since then, it somehow didn't release me. Um, therefore, I also contributed two and a half years to Kubernetes release team itself and um, to other Kubernetes related projects. As well, I initiated with the CNCF, the Environmental Sustainability Working Group, which we're talking partially about today. So the first great news is, um, depending on when you will watch this video, either we're still a working group or we're already a technical advisory group, depending on um, the results. If we will be a technical advisory group, um, we'll be released later. So I cannot say it yet, but um, as this is recorded, depending on when you will see it, you're yeah, either one or the other. So. Before we can go deep into this talk, uh, I first need to give you some terminology because maybe some of you are experts in this field, maybe some of you are not. And I want to ensure that everyone can follow along. When I'm talking about emissions, then I mean every kind of greenhouse gases. And yes, this is another terminology, but these are all gases which are caused by human beings by burning fossil fuels, or which are actually can be also naturally appear by uh, biological processes uh, through animals, uh, through um, deep freezing of the ground and releasing the sun and so on. Emissions can also include particles, microparticles. Um, for example, when you're driving a car and all the burned fossil fuel particles flying around. So greenhouse gases, um, therefore, also from the way of how it is named, um, actually anticipate that it is heating up whatever is inside. How does it work? Well, by burning, for example, coal or gas, most of the time we will we'll re we'll release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, but also other gases like methane and so on. And they're invisible, but they're like a blanket around the Earth. And the sunlight, which is traveling towards the Earth, is normally partially reflected from the surface and go back to space. Now, the greenhouse gases are very good in catching the infrared light and some other lights, but mainly infrared light, and throw it back to the Earth. So what happened is that everything that makes the Earth's surface hot is coming back to us again. And that's why we have a heating and global warming. If I'm talking about carbon footprint, this means like um, everything which you can calculate together, um, which is related to either a person or organization, it can be a software, about the carbon dioxide in total, which is yeah, embodied to this. And therefore we are directly in the next terminology Embodied emissions are basically um, all kind of emissions which are released to the earth um, for producing something. This can be a glass of water. It can be a headset, a watch, a chair you're sitting on. Yeah. Everything of this needs energy and the energy is most likely somewhere produced by burning gas or oil or coal or whatsoever. 
And so you see a lot of these terminologies are somehow yeah, built on each other, but have slightly different meanings. And when you're really deep into this topic or when you want to come close to this topic, then you will also find something called scopes. And scopes are actually defining uh, whether we have a direct, indirect, or a very indirect way of uh, causing this carbon emissions. So scope one means that if you drove with a car um, to Dublin, for example, then this is a scope one emission because you have a direct impact on causing this. Scope two is what for most people working with software, with cloud providers is very relevant because this is where we have uh, an actual impact on how. Well, you have, for example, your application running on a cloud provider, and this cloud provider somehow needs energy. So the energy, obviously, is somewhere produced, release CO2. But this also means that your service is causing this energy consumption and therefore also release of CO2. So you have a kind of indirect influence on it, but you still could influence it. And this is what we are going to talk about today most of the time. And last but not least, there are scope three emissions. And scope three is actually everything what is in your production line, but you do not have a, that direct influence on it. So if you order a server rack full of servers and disks and whatsoever, then all of the single components requires energy and they are getting delivered from some other manufacturers who also have produced it and needs to transport it and you have people who needs to go to the work and so on and so forth. And actually all of these emissions needs to be put and calculated together for the scope three emissions, which are then embodied into the server or the server rack, which you have in your data center. And there you can see this can be a rabbit hole and can be very difficult. But we'll come to this later. So for scope two, what is actually the problem? Well, the global data centers are utilizing at the moment around 2% of the whole energy worldwide. This is comparable and even more than some smaller minor countries. And it's expected that within the next years, this will grow by additional 2%. The most craziest thing is that there will be a peak and it most likely will not stop there, but this is the direction which some forecasts are thinking of um, to reach around 12% of consumed energy globally. And I'm sorry, there's a writing mistake by 2040, which is a huge number. This is bigger than countries like Germany and Japan and France, for example, together. But how does this happen? Well, we produce every day more and more data and we distribute this whole thing. IoT is not just the buzzword, it's really happening. But what IoT, IoT is actually doing is producing data and send it back and forth. And then you have the digitalization itself. Also for countries who are just stepping into digitalization, they need more servers, more compute capacities. Well, you see where it's going. It's getting more and more and more. And it's not expected to getting less. Plus, we have obviously some old systems. They're difficult to optimize. They need old hardware because it cannot be replaced. And they are like the foundation line of all of these you know, causes uh, for, re for releasing carbon emissions. And carbons emissions are actually everywhere. This is something which we need to be aware of. Um, and this is also outside of this room and outside of this topic from open source and cloud native. Everything causes in some way or the other carbon and the pollution of the environment. And this is what we have to work on. So for me, it's important what we can do. In my professional day life as an IT consultant, I can help also companies to be aware of that even their software, which they cannot physically touch, are causing the, the release of carbon emissions to our air and therefore making this planet more hot.
And this is something which we have to change. So that's what we are going to talk today partially about and what we are thinking what we can do from a cloud native perspective um, to get a little bit better. So as a working group, our goal is to advocate for and to develop and to support and to help to evaluate environmental sustainability initiatives. So everything what in the cloud native technology landscape is somehow trying to make the things better um, is where we want to go into and see how we can help them. And what we want to help to reach is a net zero goal. This means that in the end, um, ideally the software does not cause any more any kind of carbon emissions. As you have seen, this can be very complicated, especially if you think about scope three. So we also need to think about to simplify processes and make the life easier to really identify this. We have a couple of main activities defined. This is nothing which is uh, nailed down. Um, this can change, but this is the first step, the first things we have in mind um, what we can do. So on the one hand side, we want to identify and define and also developing tools or help to develop tools um, to grow into this direction and to get better. We have one major issue. We will need to quantify where energy is consumed from applications and be very precise to identify, okay, this component actually utilizes it more. Well, this one, it actually looks big, but it doesn't use so much and so on. We need to develop recommendations to reduce energy um, and to get better with the software efficiency. For this, we need the community. We need to reach out to the community. We need to partner with them. We need to help them to understand and to find first points where they can work on getting better with it. But we do not have to reinvent the whole wheel. There are a lot of foundations out there since many years, I need to say, that are working on certain kind of topics also in this direction, like the Green Software Foundation. But we'll come to them later. But we need to collaborate with them. And this is where we see the community, this working group, attack as a door opener, as someone who can help to go easier to the cloud native community and, yeah, show best practices and explain how to be very efficient with writing software. And therefore, we also need to be able to evaluate um, how is the architectural health of the application of the software um, of the projects in the cloud native landscape and where we can start doing the changes and implementing changes. So I call this better together because we have the Green Software Foundation and the name anticipate it's everything about software. We have an open compute project uh, initialized by Facebook, which is about hardware and data center optimization. And then we have the OSC, which are working on helping actually the economy to switch their capital workflows from climate harming investments to climate changing investments. So because the long text is a little bit too complicated to read, I try to put it more in some clear bullet points. The Queen's Office Foundation is doing an awesome, awesome job. And the target is to build a culture and to bring this culture of building sustainable software into software development teams and make this a core priority. And for example, the software carbon intensity specification is one of these little things it's not that little, there's a lot of brain power work go into, um, but it's this little things which helps the team to actually measure how good they are and if they can get better too. Within the Open Compute project, we see awesome initiatives like heat reusage, because if we do not need to heat again, because we can use it already, um, this means that we reduce actually the amount of course carbon emissions. And there's also the thinking about future technologies. So if you build specific chips for artificial intelligence and deep neural networks and so on, who are very efficient exactly for this use case, 
then they are also being better to be utilized rather than a general purpose compute instance, which needs tons of energy. And I said, we have the OSC who is thinking about to implement a data pool and, and a software platform to empower sustainable solutions. So how do I see this? Well, in the middle we have, uh, for me, a typical stack, how I can find it nowadays nearly everywhere. Um, for sure, quite often the data center for me is not visible anymore, but everything above that is what you can see day by day. If you start on the uh, top left corner, we have the Green Software Foundation and how they can help actually to optimize and teach coding best practices for the software, which is running, for example, in a container. It doesn't need to run in a container, obviously, but, uh, well, <laughs> I'm the Kubernetes guy, so we need to have somewhere a container at least. The OSC is to about to empower the change of the use case and to focus more on environmental friendly and more sustainable solutions rather than to environmental harming solutions. And they want to do this by a data-driven AI platform. On the bottom, you can see the Open Compute project, which is looking into optimizing data centers and, and hardware and so on. Well, obviously there's something missing and this is where the environmental sustainability working group comes in because the cloud native environment and the universe of the Kubernetes and around Kubernetes has such a tremendous impact. It's something which we cannot skip in the stack. And there's a few things which you can easily do like optimize container images and the build processes around it. Um, but also about scaling and scheduling. And there's tons of little best practices what we can do already today um, and which can help, but we have still a long way to go. Nevertheless, as you can see, when we put these foundations, and this is just a selection of foundations. Uh, I want to be very careful here. I, there are a couple of other um, very cool groups uh, and, and people who are since years working on ideas how to how to get better here um, but i think these are the for us at the moment most seen ones or which fits into this explanation how we can think about this whole stack and how we can really optimize it from the first kilogram of baton touching your crown building a data center up to um, what is your use case and what are you going to sell as a product and how and yeah, in which way it is thought through as a product. I personally believe that we can be only successful in this change if we are working together. This means that we have to solve the different dimensions um, within the computing environments and if you just tackle one single piece of it, this is like a drop in the ocean. But if you work on all of these pieces and get also there in a good sink, then this is like a river into the ocean, at least. So it will be even more important also in the future. As you have heard in the introduction, everything is growing. We get more compute powers around the world. It's going to the edge. It's going to be more data. We have to uh, digitalize more and more countries and so on and so forth. The scale we have to catch. We cannot reduce it. And I also personally believe it would be dumb to stop it because to connect the world also means to free and open the world, to um, allow everyone to have the same rights of getting information and uh, the same rights to implement their businesses and, and build something for them. But we need to get also better. And I think this is the point where we together can start and optimizing how um, we do IT, how we do software, how we do infrastructure. So cloud native, what could Kubernetes and cloud native actually do? Well, First and foremost, it's very important to understand that Kubernetes itself, it's not a hypervisor, it's not an infrastructure or something else. From 
my perspective working very long time is Kubernetes. This is an extensible platform. It is a powerful API, which actually can run nearly everywhere. It doesn't matter. You can run it on the edge, on a global scale. Well, there is no really limitation into it. And it is very good at managing the workload and uh, handle it, um, either to keep it alive, but also to scale it up and down. And it is very good and integrated meanwhile with hypervisors and cloud providers. So what you can give as a command to a Kubernetes platform can also go directly into a cloud provider. And this is important, this connection, because otherwise we maybe can scale somehow Kubernetes and the workload on top of it, but we still then also need to communicate and talk to the cloud provider. Well, it's easy for APIs and other stuff, but well, you do not want to reinvent one layer after the other layer after the other layer, because then it's also getting complicated to make the right fit on every of these different layers. And all these aspects together uh, make Kubernetes actually a very perfect target to optimize because it's acting a little bit like a clue between a couple of these dimensions. But um, hard is bleeding to say it, Kubernetes is not always a solution. And I think we are also here have the responsibility to define what is the break even point for sustainability and performance and efficiency and where it makes sense to utilize Kubernetes and where it doesn't make sense. Just to run a simple web server uh, where you have 500 people maybe visiting it per, per week is not a reason to run a Kubernetes. But if you have a very large scaled environment of tons of applications who all behave a little bit differently, scaling up, down, left, right, um, have different resource uh, re demands and so on, then we talk about it. And this doesn't need to be also hundreds. It, it, it is enough if you are a medium-sized, already sometimes also startup-sized company, because even small companies often have very large scale little applications. So what we can do nowadays and what we have to, or to be a little bit more negative, what we can't. Um, on the one hand side, what we can do, well, I said already, we can optimize container images. We can make them more smaller. We can um, ensure that they're starting up fast. And all these helps that we need less computing power, less network traffic, and so on. Of course. We can schedule containers for high density. So rather than on one server is running one container, we can pack them all together, if it makes sense. And we can also scale containers to zero, because I don't need containers which idle around and wait that once in two hours, one request happens. You can also scale the whole clusters. And, and I think this is today one of the most important steps, but it's often forgotten. We have to optimize the nodes and the hardware. Um, you can see it on AWS, the um, ARM-based Graviton. CPU instances at the moment are very uh, favorable by customers. We can optimize the operating system uh, to run just containerized workload and delete every other packages and piece of software which we don't need. On the one hand side, to reduce the needed space, but also um, and sometimes in some cases to reduce the amount of background noise of the operating system level. However, what is very important to understand is that all the scaling and scheduling and, and um, reducing sizes and so on, this ha can happen, but it doesn't happen because we know which carbon does it cause we maybe know the amount of energy is used, but also not that much. So this is on our have to side. Uh, we have a very big issue. We need carbon data. We need the energy data, how much energy is used by a service to decide whether we can scale it down or delete it or whatsoever. For me personally, I also have the big question in my mind, is there a future without containers? Can we even get more smaller, more faster? Something which is even more resource friendly? I believe so. Um, I think one of the potential answers is WebAssembly. 
but this is a totally different topic. Nevertheless, I think this can be, again, a point to improve because rather than we need to transfer hundreds of megabytes and gigabytes for every image we need to bring somewhere, we're talking about kilobytes. And this means that all the processes getting faster and more efficient. Nevertheless, I'm going into the wrong direction of the topic. Um, also, I very much love it. I think what is very painful, and these are the two last points uh, we have to actually very seriously discuss is to design architectures for sustainability. This will stay in conflict to security, performance, high availability, and um, yeah, well, depending on which kind of security requirements you have, um, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, difficulties and also around the whole network communication encryption here, um, which all of these is most of the time at the moment quite unsustainable, quite inefficient. And last but not least, and I'm very sorry to say, but we have to improve the power management of servers. Your standard server is most of the time very poor in it. Um, there's a couple of studies from a few universities. I can find them and maybe link it also later. Or um, uh, if you ask me, I will find it and uh, share it to you directly. Um, that has shown that servers who are in a standard modus running um, are nearly using the same amount of energy like a server in the echo modus. There's just a little drop of energy consumption and this is because the server still needs some kind of base level of energy, but it's still quite high. And I think this is also the reason why cloud providers develop and build their own infrastructure, their own hardware with their own scheduler, uh, with their own power management, sorry, um, to be very much optimized. Because if nothing is running on the server, they shut it off and keep it on, um, just ready to be powered on if really, really needed. Um, because having all of these servers idling around would cost millions and millions of dollars, um, which wouldn't make sense. So again, a key missing link is on the one hand side, the data about the energy consumption. We have a few options which are slowly going into this direction. You can more or less get it, uh, maybe estimate it. Um, if you're running on hardware or um, some hypervisors, uh, it's even easier to get it uh, with EPM controller or Redfish. But on the other hand side, and this is a very crucial and important point, is data which is missed about the cost CO2 per kilowatt hours. And here, maybe if you're working at an energy provider, it would be great if you could open up some APIs to read this information. Um, for sure, you will maybe give this information also to your end user, like the data center owners. But um, I think in a digitalized world, it would be great to have this information on just on the hand and the fingertips to, to read it. Um, but yeah, I think without this information, we optimize for energy consumption, but we do not optimize for the cost CO2 emissions. And these are two different topics. I can run my software in a data center. It utilizes tons of kilowatt hours and it doesn't cause any CO2. And I can have one single application running in another data center, which causes tons of CO2 because the only power source around it is based on coal, for example. So this is very important um, that we get better here. So this is also the final boss fight, which we come to. We have the missing data and we have the scope three. Scope three, again, is about the embodied carbon emissions, um, about your hardware, which you order, the data center, the building construction, whatever. And what is everything in the production line and logistics of the production are related to this. Again, just to give you a high level picture, if you order a server, there are some chips inside, there are some cables inside, there's some other microcontroller inside. There's a piece of metal around it. 
and all of these different things are somewhere else produced. So again, somewhere else is someone using energy, which must be produced. And there are also transportation in between, maybe with a ship or a truck. And then you have even systems around it, like an ERP system to manage the resources and to plan probably the resources. So you see, this is a very, very crazy rabbit hole. And in the end, um, the scope three emissions are guessed around 80% of all of the emissions um, when you think about a single service. So thinking about your piece of software is running, let's say in your private data center, um, we're talking here most of the time scope two, maybe a little bit scope one when you drive with the company car back and forth, but everything else is in scope three. And there is very difficult to get this information. There's a few initiatives to clarify this, but yeah, this is a long way to go. And that's where, where a lot of um, foundations need actually help into. So long story short, we need your participation. And um, if not us, uh, if you're not so much with the uh, whole cloud native Kubernetes thingy, um, maybe have a look at the other initiatives, which I have uh, shortly named. They're also very great. They have a couple of projects running, um, which are all very, very famous and, and nice to see in which direction they are and how holistic they are thought of. But if you're interested to work with us together, um, join us on the CNCF Slack. Um, you will be easily able to find it. Search for environmental sustainability, and you can find our uh, channel to discuss with us. Or find us in the CNCF GitHub. Uh, repository. Also there, again, search for environmental sustainability. Um, we have there some discussions going on. You see the current work artifacts and so on. Um, so it's a good starting point if you want to directly give some small contribution or have your own idea which you want to throw into the room. And last but not least, if you would like to stay updated also on major decisions or whether we are getting from a working group to tech, um, join the mailing list. And um, most importantly, Meet us virtually. Um, our meetings are documented in the GitHub repository in the Slack channel, so it's easy to find us uh, online and to join our conversations, bring up your ideas, thoughts, um, and change with us a little bit something. So finally, we have to start now. And to be serious with you, we should have started 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, but uh, better late than never, I would say hopefully slightly optimistic here um, because everyone needs to be with us in this boat. Um, we're talking here about open source and software, which is a part of this whole story. It's not the major part of this whole story, but if we want to prevent that in future, 12% um, of the global energy consumption is caused by IT and it's maybe just six or eight or nine percent then this savings would be leading back to the initiatives we maybe kick off today and where we maybe start to optimize today however we need every profession on board and everyone needs to be part of it from uh, marketing to manufacturers to transportation and logistics um, everyone has to think about and change something because only together we can change the world, uh, how it will be in the future and keep it um, worth living on it. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you found it halfway interesting. You're happy to join us, come to us. And um, I'm very excited to see you maybe in our meetings um, and have us joining in our discussions.